good Josh your boy Ross back at again with another video so we're gonna check out 10 WWE stables that inexplicably lasted for seconds and went nowhere sometimes uh I guess you can say things may hit the creative room floor and then they're like you know what we're gonna put you in the stable and then the stable lasts for a little bit and then they just disband just randomly uh who remembers uh the core who remembers them uh, it was supposed to be the revitalization of uh the nexus that didn't really go nowhere you know and, it, and it's just one of those things where people try to make a stable work and maybe it just doesn't get over so we're gonna check out some of these moments where they just last for a little bit and then they just poof vanished never to be seen again we're gonna check this out appreciate all love and support and i am still yeah, and speed a YouTube wrestling champ of the world. Let's do this thing. Are the key to a successful stable in WWE? Are the key to a successful stable in WWE is making sure all the members of the group have purpose and value. <laughs> Iconic groups such as Evolution and The Shield worked because each member of the group was a Great, star, and the lasting factions. legacy of the stable will live on forever. Unfortunately, there are those stables whose time as a unit is rather brief, and mm -hmm. it's often forgotten about by the wider WWE this. fan base. These stables in question benefit oh, absolutely nobody, and they're ultimately scrapped either due to a change of creative plans or the stable being unable to connect with the audience. But which ones were they? Or well, join us now as WrestleMania looks at, at WWE <laughs> stables that went absolutely nowhere. Oh, <laughs> had a pretty cool premise and idea, but they. It just it, it be sure to subscribe too. and hit that notification bell for daily wrestling videos and follow us on Facebook for exclusive lists. Also check out wrestleamia.co.uk and on our wrestling channel, Incredible. Number 10, Knights of the Lone Wolf. Are you probably thinking, who on earth what? are the Knights of the Lone Wolf? Well, the stable debuted in 2021 and featured Baron Corbin along with Steve Cutler and Wesley Blake. Unfortunately, just as the stable was getting going, Cutler and Blake really were thing? abruptly released from WWE I due to I, budget I, I cuts, and thing. the stable was disbanded. Blake would discuss the origins and creative plans for the stable during an interview with I did Inside not know the Ropes, thing, and bro. this is what the former WWE star had to say. Creative came to us with the look they wanted. They wanted the clean-shaven look. They wanted us with the hoodies, with suits, and stuff like that. They wanted to go like a more modern, athletic, sports entertainer look. We were very excited for it. And I know I was very excited to work with Corbin and get back on TV and, and just kind of get your foot back in the door. Once we started with Baron Corbin, we were very excited because there were some creative plans going forward with us working with the Mysterios, which is one of those dream matches that everyone wishes that, that they could have because Rey Mysterio is such a legend of and course. he could still go in the ring. And getting to work with his son Dominic would have been so much fun. Damn. Number nine, Apple. Now, there are some stables in WWE that, that, that was just last for one single night and never get mentioned again. This was the case with the Apple Stable, which stood for Allied People Powered by Loathing Everything That You Stand For. The group consisted of Santino Marella, Mark Henry, Daniel Bryan, and Evan Bourne. Wow. They were put together to work against the infamous Core Faction. Hmm, get it? Apple Core? Yeah. <laughs> and I just talked about Core too, just recent, like at the beginning of this video. That's, that's funny, man. Well, the Apple Stable lost their first match after Morella was pinned by Heath Slater, and WWE decided to pull the plug on the stable after just one single matchup. Apple. It was a shame as the group had some fantastic talent, and the majority of the members didn't have a really prominent role on television at the time. Number 8, The Cosmic Wasteland. That, that the so Cosmic cringe. Wasteland stable had a ton of potential. It featured Stardust joining forces Didn't know with this the was Ascension the thing in. Whilst their segments were rather cartoonish in nature, the stable actually had a lot of support from fans. The issue was mainly a lack of television time, as most of the TV time devoted to the trio was on secondary WWE shows Damn. such as Main Event, a show which unfortunately fans tend to ignore. Of WWE course. had no interest in devoting meaningful TV time to the group, and this meant that the connection with fans was quickly lost. The stable was randomly taken off television and Rhodes departed from the company in 2016, officially putting an end to the once promising stable. Wow. Number 7. The X Factor Didn't In early 2001, <laughs> WWE attempted to give X-Pac somewhat of- I ain't gonna lie to you. Ascension, they, they were pretty solid tag teams in, uh, in NXT. And I feel like they were pretty solid on the main roster as well, in my personal opinion. I, I think they had a nice move set. I don't know. People didn't really... I don't know... I can't really remember too many people really getting into their characters and like their gimmicks, but I rocked with them as a tag team. Have a push by creating a stable led by the former European champion. 
X-Pac was going to be joined by Just Incredible and Albert to create The X Factor. Whilst there was certainly great talent in the stable, fans just had no desire yeah. to see the trio team up. The stable was never presented as a credible threat and it was never made clear to the audience the why the group was even together. The group would fizzle out by the end of 2001, but thanks to a number of interviews, we know that all three members of the group had a blast working alongside each other. Oh, well. Number six, The Union. As as the fun. WWE Attitude Era was a time where WWE oh, tried fuck. anything and everything, yes. and this extended to creating new stables. In 1999, they created The Union, which stood for Union of People You Ought to Respect. So we do have initials. Wow. Just call us up yours, Shane! What? <laughs> the stable had some legendary WWE superstars attached to it, including Mankind and The Big Show. The group formed to rebel against the corporate ministry, and the group could have easily been identified thanks to them carrying around wooden 2x4s. <laughs> when the corporate ministry quickly disbanded in the summer of 1999, so did the union, as the stable casually drifted apart without any logical explanation. Huh. It was appreciated that WWE tried to create a credible foil for the corporate ministry, but they clearly didn't plan how they wanted the faction warfare to play out. Yeah. Number five, the cabinet. <laughs> a WWE the union just walking around with fucking two by fours. <laughs> we decided to attempt to elevate JBL's WWE title reign in the summer of 2004 by giving him his own stable known as the cabinet. Mm -hmm. The group consisted mainly of Orlando Jordan, the Basham brothers, but they were also joined by Amy Webber and Jillian Hall. Now in theory, the stable should have worked, but it was clear that JBL didn't need a stable, as he could carry his title reign on his own. Nah, JBL was, was so good, impressive he, he as a heel character heel and his, his promo own. work was so impactful that everyone in the stable just seemed mediocre as a result. Stables should attempt to give mid to lower card wrestlers a chance in the spotlight, but the cabinet didn't really do this. Facts. It was clear to fans that Jordan wasn't the best in-ring talent and WWE had no time for the tag division during this time, meaning that the Basham brothers had already reached their glass ceiling. Damn. Number 4, Judgment Day version 1.0. Oh, now now the 1. idea of Edge creating a stable was ah. an incredibly exciting prospect. Not gonna lie to you, version 2.0? Doing pretty good. <laughs> I will say that. Judgment Day, the second version of them. Uh, they're, they're doing pretty good for themselves. This concept would take shape at WrestleMania 38 as Damian Priest would join forces with Edge to create the Judgment Day. Judgment Day had a sinister undertone to it and it looked like the aim of the stable was to push Priest into the main event scene. The stable would then add Rhea Ripley which was a genius move yes. and it looked like the stable was going to be one of the all time greats. However, in the summer of 2022, WWE changed their creative direction for the group. Finn Balor would then join the group, and Balor alongside the other members of the group would turn on Edge, officially mm -hmm. kicking him out of the stable. Now, the initial version of the Judgment Day stable was dead just mere months after it started. It was an utter shame as the group being led by Edge was a surefire way to make brand new stars. Number 3, Thuggin' and Buggin' Enterprises. Wait, Thug what? Thuggin' and Buggin' Enterprises? But before we get into that, I think the issue with the first version of um, Judgment Day is, well, one, it's like, I don't know. It's like they didn't seem as much of a threat as they were once they kicked Edge out. And I, I think the reports were, you know, they were going with the supernatural route and Edge wasn't kind of really rocking with that, which I'm glad they didn't do. Um, Like, they kind of felt like an afterthought. I, I didn't really get this sense of, like, oh no, here comes the judgment day. It's about to be some 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 uh shenanigans and a whole bunch of uh <laughs> BS happening, you know, somebody's gonna get hurt. I didn't get that feel from them. I don't even think they were really they were really winning like that, to be honest. I felt like they were kind of a group that could barely get any significant wins under their belt. It wasn't until Finn Balor came into the mix and then uh Triple H started taking things over as well when they started to really uh, come off as credible threats, and I, I can appreciate that. So yeah, man, that the first version of them, it just I mean, it didn't land. It was interesting, but then it it it, it kind of the interest level definitely uh, kind of uh, fell fell apart. Buggin' and Buggin' Enterprises had an Duggan interesting premise. Initially, the idea for the stable was going to see Theodore Long recruit African American superstars who believed that they were being held down. Long would first recruit D'Lo Brown before he expanded <laughs> the group to include the likes of Rodney Mack and Christopher Nowinski. The group suffered massively from a lack of credibility, and despite Long being a tremendous promo guy, he just couldn't get the members of his stable over to the degree I WWE wanted. <laughs> Eventually, Mark Henry joined the stable, but in 2003, Henry had yet to put it all together in the ring as he was still rather green. 
The stable would slowly come to an end with much fanfare, and Long would find himself in a new role as SmackDown general manager, yep. <laughs> where he would stay for a number of years. Yep. <laughs> number two, the League of Nations. But the main purpose of WWE putting together the League of them, Nations was though. to get Roman Reigns over as a babyface. Mm -hmm. It consisted of Sheamus, Wade Barrett, Rusev, and Alberto Del Rio. And even these four talents couldn't help get Reigns over to the level nope, they wanted. It didn't work. Fans could see straight through the WWE and what they were trying to do. And yeah, Sheamus when they when they created the League of Nations, it's like we know what you're trying to do. We know exactly what you're trying to do. You're trying to get Roman over. It's not. It's not going to work. <laughs> During an interview, even admitted that the stable didn't do any of the members any favors. They did. It only existed to help Reigns. The group broke up officially in April of 2016 as all active members of the group walked out during a match. The group would then proceed to have a backstage brawl, putting an end to this lackluster group. Yeah, and number one, out. FTR KO. In the summer of 2019, The Revival joined forces with Randy Orton on television to feud with The New Day. This trio being put together received unanimous love and support from fans as it resulted notice. in The Revival being used in a meaningful manner and it gave Orton something new and fresh to one. work with. There were calls to make the stable a permanent fixture in WWE, Damn. especially from Orton, who was so impressed with the work of the revival that he personally went to Vince McMahon to request that FTRKO become a full-time deal. Damn. But McMahon outright refused. During an interview with Jim Cornette on his podcast, this is what the current AEW stars had to say in relation to Orton getting the extra mile to make the stable a permanent reality. With Randy, who has become one of our one of our mentors and one of our really close friends, uh, who we talk to every single day, um, he fought for us so hard to get us on TV with him every single week because he believed in our work ethic and he believed in what we brought to the table. Uh, and we watched him go to Vince every single week or Hunter or whoever and say, "We've got to keep this up." Damn. Just take your punishment. Oh, no, no, no. Oh. They have it for Damn, WWE bro, that State. sounds actually pretty fucking cool. I mean, granted, I am happy that FTR is doing, you know, doing what they love and they're getting appreciated for it, even though I would still like to see them more prominently featured in AEW. But nevertheless, man, dang, man, Vince, bro, Vince dropped the ball. That could have been a cool little stable for him because they're arguably the best tag team in the world that could have been really good i didn't know that was even the thing that's how short it probably was and shout out to randy trying to really push that because that could have definitely helped them out because at one point before they were getting before they left they their momentum was cooling off like tremendously I remember from when they came from NXT, how hot they were, to when they were about to leave WWE. They weren't as hot as they should have. They wasn't as over. Honestly, I don't think they were as appreciated because WWE didn't really give a damn about the tag team division, you know? So it really would have been cool to see Randy kind of help elevate their popularity with, you know, more people, man, because they are fantastic. As a tag team, they are fantastic so comment down below let me know how many of these stables did you know about because i feel out the loop because a lot of these i did not know was an actual thing so let me know down below oh it's not belay what, what am i talking about down below which stables you actually recognized and remembered from this video but i appreciate all the love and support you guys have shown on the channel and i am still your undisputed youtube wrestling champ of the world appreciate y'all kicking the me see y'all next one peace